Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is My New York. There was a time in this country when thousands of Americans who worked for the federal government were fired for the high crime of being homosexual. Committee will please come to order. Homosexuals must not be handling top secret material. The pervert is easy prey to the blackmailer. That brief clip is from a new film, The Lavender Scare, a wrenching account of paranoid political repression and the lives it destroyed. Josh Howard produced and directed The Lavender Scare. He tells us about his journey of discovery next. Josh Howard, welcome. It's Thank good you. to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for having what me. What a strong and, and disturbing and hateful story. Film is great. The story is hateful. <laughs> How long have you been working on this thing? Well, it took about 10 years uh, begin wow. beginning to end. Yeah. Uh, from, the, uh, from the time I first met the author of the book, we talked about possibly making a documentary out of it. And What's it? David Johnson? David, David Johnson. Uh, who wrote the, Lavender, the book called The Lavender Scare. He did. And I just happened to come across the book, and I knew really nothing about this, this history. Uh, I thought I knew American history and some gay history, having lived through a lot of it. But the idea that the government so systematically went about firing people, this came as a surprise to me. Let's define The Lavender Scare, you know, in, in its rough outline. Well, in the years following World War II, there was this, uh, there was a uh, theory that gay people were security risks. The idea was that they were uh, susceptible to blackmail uh, by enemy agents. Right. Well, I, I mean, it grows out of the Red Scare. Commies everywhere. Um, what's his name? The Senator... Uh, Joe McCarthy. McCarthy. Uh, the State Department is loaded with communists. And... Homosexual acts were illegal at that time. That's true. So if you were gay or lesbian and worked for the federal government, you were presumably committing illegal acts, and that's the basis for the, you know, idea that, oh, these people are... You could be blackmailed. You could be vulnerable to blackmail. Right. Had, had, it, it's, it's logic that... Um, that kind of sounds like it makes sense, but, but, it, but it, it's really a perverse logic. Isn't well, it? in a way, it does make sense. Gay people were susceptible to blackmail. As it turned out, there wasn't a single case of a gay man or lesbian submitting to blackmail by a foreign agent, but it was our own government that was blackmailing people because that's how they were able to get information about who was, who was gay. Let's um, just hear from some of the voices. This is sort of a teaser from the film, uh, and we'll get further into the details of who these people were and their stories, but watch this. I was called to the FBI office. They wouldn't allow legal representation. I was a scared kid. They wouldn't reveal the evidence. They said, we have information, you are homosexual. Do you have any comment? And they would threaten exposure. I submitted my resignation. I lost my job at the patent office. That was the end of it. I would have. That last fellow is uh, Dr. Frank Franklin Kameny, and if this film has a, a hero, he is it. And we'll get back to these people and their stories, uh, and you'll hear more from them. Um, you know, you say the government was blackmailing people, and in, a, and, and in reality, that's what they were doing. They were, they were finding evidence that you or I was homosexual, and they were saying, if you don't leave, number one, we're going to fire you, but number two, we're going to tell, you know, your, your family, family your, your friends. It will be in your permanent employment record, so when you apply for your next job, they will know why you were fired by the government. Uh, if, if you cooperated and gave the names of other people who you knew to be gay, then the government would go a little easier on you. But meanwhile, those people would get dragged into the net. And as the film points out, I think the, the State Department had a uh, lie detector test program and the FBI set up a sex, what they called a sex deviant program. There were, at, at one point, there were over a thousand agents 
uh, assigned specifically to investigate the private lives of, uh, of government employees. How many, can you put a number, I mean, you say in the film tens of thousands, I mean, there's a lot of people whose lives were, whose careers were destroyed and whose lives were destroyed. And it's impossible to really put a number on it because the government documents, you know, have a certain number of people who were fired and a certain number of people who resigned for no specific reason. But even those numbers don't tell the story because that doesn't include the people who were denied employment uh, during pre-employment background checks, people who never applied for jobs because they knew they would be found out. Uh, the government policy applied to private companies that did business with the government. Mm. So there's no way to know how many private employers uh, fired uh, gay, gay employees. Uh, you know, through NATO, our uh, government asked our NATO allies to conduct purges in their countries. So there's no way to find out in Germany and France and Great Britain how many people were fired at the behest of the United States. Did they? These other governments? They did. They did. There were uh, uh, gay employees at the United Nations, and our government threatened to cut off funding to the United Nations if these employees weren't fired, and they were fired. Was it about the time that the, that the Kinsey report came out on male uh, sexuality? Well, it was. And that was 1948. That's right. And to some degree, that's what created what would become the Lavender Scare, because up to that point, people didn't give much thought to homosexuality. When the Kinsey Report came out with a startling statistic about 37% of American men, according to Kinsey, had had at least one homosexual experience, mm. that got people's attention. And that combined with the fear about national security during the, uh, during the Red Scare is really what combined to create this, this Lavender Scare. And so it's, it's sort of ramping up in the late 40s into the early 50s, and then President Eisenhower kind of makes it official. Well, I shouldn't say kind of. He makes he it did. official, doesn't he? It became a big campaign issue in the 1952 presidential campaign. The State Department undertook this effort because they were under pressure from Senator McCarthy to clean out communists, and the question was, how many communists have you fired? And the problem was there weren't that many communists in the State Department. But they wanted to demonstrate that they were tough on yeah. security. So they came up with this idea, let's get rid of homosexuals because we can say they are security risks. Well, I imagine the government might have rethought making so much of this public because it would lead to the obvious question, well, well gee, if these were security risks, how... why, why'd you hire them? And that's exactly why this story is, is not well known. Because as, as the years went on, the government stopped releasing numbers about how many people were being fired exactly for that reason. And of course, the gay people who were being fired, they didn't want to talk about it because they wanted to stay in the closet and, and get on with their lives. And so uh, you know, th this was happening in, in secret. And it, there was this conspiracy of silence. No one wanted to talk about how many people were being fired. And, and you know, that's really the reason we know so uh, little about it. <laughs> one of your interviewees, one of the victims, uh, a woman named Joan Cassidy, who eventually became a, a captain, I think, in the Navy, um, tells a harrowing story that goes right to your point about the secret, you know, the, the, the victims themselves keeping it, keeping it quiet. Let, let's listen here a bit to, to uh, Joan Cassidy. When I got the telephone call that said I had been selected for captain, I knew I had just been selected to hold the highest rank a woman could hold in the Navy Reserve. After I was promoted, three women captains came to me and said, we want to try to make you the first woman admiral in the Navy Reserve. And I thought about it, and I thought, but what if, when I try for that, when I go for the gold ring, somebody goes looking, and they find what I've been hiding all these years? I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. 
I wanted it so badly and had wanted it so badly all of my life and finally got it and then found out they didn't want me. I, you know, that idea that, that the government would not only fire you, but that they'd send the letter home. Um, well, exactly, and that's such a great example of how the damage done by this policy goes so far beyond just the numbers of people fired. Her name and her story is not going to show up in any statistic about the damage done by this, this policy, but it's just an example of, of really how, how widespread the, the effect of, of this government policy was. Uh, just to button up the Eisenhower part, uh, he actually issued an executive order. The executive order uh, 10450 directed all agencies of the U.S. government to remove what were called sexual perverts yeah. from the ranks. And sexual pervert referred specifically to homosexuals. Uh, it was a campaign promise from the 1952 campaign. Eisenhower and uh, Richard Nixon, his, his running mate, ran on a platform of restore morality to government. And that meant getting rid of gay people. And three months into his presidency, he signed the executive order. And that really made official what had been kind of the ad hoc policy of the government up to that point. And it's a policy that uh, it just blows my mind, as I'm sure anybody else who would see this film, and I hope you do see this film, um, this policy was on the books until Clinton, President Clinton, in when, 95? 1995. Uh, it was still, being gay was still grounds to be denied security clearance, which in many positions in the federal government mean you, you didn't get the job. And it was Clinton in 1995 uh, who uh, finally reversed the, uh, the, the last vestiges of what was the Eisenhower executive order. Let's talk about some more of the um victims. Andrew Ference, is that how to pronounce it? It is. And he was a Foreign Service officer. He was. He was the uh, son of immigrants. He was the first guy in his family to go to college. He got a job after college as, um, in, in the Foreign Service and he was discovered to be gay. He was working at the embassy in Paris. He was discovered uh, to be gay and he was, he was fired and he was told to report uh, within the next week to Washington where he was going to be um, interrogated about his friends and his contacts, and he, he never made it to Washington. He committed suicide, is what he did. He did. I want uh, our audience to uh, hear from uh, Carl, is it Carl Rizzi? Carl Rizzi. Who worked for the Postal Service? He was a low-level administrative assistant at the Postal Service. Yeah. And he was also a drag queen, drag performer. As a hobby, he performed in, uh, in, in drag on weekends. Listen to Carl Rizzi. It's a, it's a great story. And one day I was just minding my business at work, and two men came in, coat and tie. I asked them if I could help them. They showed me their badges. They were postal inspectors, the dreaded postal inspector. Confidential informant believed subject to be a homosexual. I had been going down to this place called the Gold Key Club at North Beach. And on Sunday afternoons, they had a drag show down the center of the top of the bar. Well, for some reason, I just felt that was my calling. They pulled out this Polaroid. And they said, is this you? Well, I looked at it and I said, yes. I, I, I. You don't know what to do. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. They've got you over a barrel. And at one point, I told them that the picture they had of me was terrible. And if they wanted a picture for their files, I could bring them a decent one. The film includes one of these investigators, a fellow named, you better pronounce it, Bartley. Bartley Fugler. Bartley Fugler, who describes very uh, 
coolly, coldly, uh, how, how they did what they did and why they did what they did. I mean, he, it's, it's a little chilling to listen to him. And, and with pride also. Yeah. You know, yeah. He said, we had people who were good at this. Bartley Fugler was one of uh, several government uh, uh, investigators who uh, uh, my associate director, Jill Landis, who's a fantastic uh, journalist, was able to track down. And we were, you know, she, she found these people and we made contact with them and we were really expecting that they would say, we don't want to have anything to do with this movie. We're not going to talk about what, you know, what we did back then. And every single one of them agreed to be interviewed, which puzzled us until we did the interviews and realized that they still don't see that there was any I I issue here or that there was any, there was any wrongdoing. They believe that they we're doing the They were right serving thing. national security. Bartley Fugler, watch this. We looked at every part of the person's life. It was an extensive investigation. We spoke to their current supervisors, their fellow employees, just about everyone his whole life. You know, his minister, his church. You'd almost set up a schematic, you know, here's John here and he's a homosexual and, and he was a fraternity brother of so-and-so who was a homosexual, and he knew so-and-so, and your employee knew these people, and he socialized with these people. So you set these kind of things up, it gave you an indication that there was some kind of a connection between these people. Well, we should come to the, uh, the hero of the piece, um, I guess. Is that, that fair? He's call him the hero, Franklin Kameny? Oh, he's the hero of the piece and a hero in the history of uh, LGBTQ rights, absolutely. So, um, well, let's let's let Franklin tell his story, and then we'll embellish on it uh, some more. I, I mean, this is this is the first guy to say no. He wasn't going. He wasn't going to put up with this, and um, and in his wake, everything changed. Franklin Cameron. One day, two uh, civil service investigators came in and they said, uh, we have information which leads us to believe you are homosexual. Do you have any comment? I said, what's the information? They said, we can't tell you. I said, well, then I have no comment. But speaking purely legalistically and procedurally, they had no problems in simply uh, firing me, denying me a security clearance. So that was denied, and uh, I was out. He's, he's quite a guy. He's a New Yorker, by the way. He, 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 he went to Richmond Hill High. He went to Queens College. He did. Got a Ph.D. at, at Harvard um, in what? Astronomy. Astronomy. Uh, brilliant guy, but also single-minded and determined. And he knew what was right, even if the rest of society didn't. And uh, as you say, he was the first person to... Uh, to fight his, his dismissal. And he, he makes it clear, you know, when, when he was confronted, um, he, his feeling was, you're wrong, I'm right, and I'm gonna show you. <laughs> and he did. He did. Uh, he, he was uh, one of those people who's just convinced that, that they're right. And, you know, he said back in the 1950s that he was gonna bring society around to his way of thinking, and sure enough, he actually managed to, to do that and, and live long enough to see the changes that, uh, that came about. I think the genius of, of his um, opposition to this was he turned it from an issue of quote-unquote national security to an issue of civil rights. Well, exactly. I mean, his point was that you know, he was entitled to, to a job just as, as any other person in any other minority group would be. And uh, that was his argument. And it did kind of reframe the whole discussion about homosexuality at the time. And he was able to, to I, I, I will use the word, force a congressional committee to hear his testimony. Talk about that. Well, a, a congressman uh, from Texas introduced legislation to uh, prevent the Manishing Society, which was Frank's organization that he founded in Washington, to prevent them from raising money, which in effect would have put them out of business. And Frank demanded a public hearing on this, and 
uh, it was granted and he became the first openly gay person to testify before Congress. That was one of the other differences between Frank and the other activists who came before. Frank wanted publicity. He wanted to be out there. He wanted to use his real name. There were, there were other gay rights groups that continued to you know, want to be under the radar and in the closet. And Frank said, if we're going to change people's opinions, we have to be out there uh, publicly and show people who we are. And um, he said uh, he was grateful for this legislation that had been introduced because it gave him a chance to testify before Congress. But even beyond that, they got a huge amount of publicity as a result. Mm. And as, as Frank told us, uh, a, a year later, he sent the congressman who introduced this legislation a framed, framed parchment uh, uh, certificate thanking him for the great service <laughs> that he had done for the Mattachine Society. You know, he, I mean, he was a warrior who, you know, was out there in the woods by himself. I mean, there, you have film in the film of him conducting a protest at the White House. There's, what, eight people walking around? Exactly. It was uh, 1965, and it was the first public gay rights protest in, in Washington. And it was a very lonely group of people. Um, who really, you know, got the ball rolling on the movement. And, you know, Stonewall is recognized uh, sort of as the start of the gay rights movement. But one of the reasons I wanted to make the film was really to pay tribute to those people who, who, who came before and who were really courageous about speaking up uh, years before Stonewall when it was really dangerous to do so. In the 60s, there's the, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement. You weren't hearing about the gay, LG, there was no LGBTQ back then. Not at all. You know, there was you know, Frank Kameny and Barbara Giddings and Jack Nichols, Lily Vincennes, a couple of other names who, you know, can be found in, in, the, in the, you know, history books. What happened? I mean, Kameny was jettisoned from the department. Uh, from, what was he? He was working for NASA, wasn't he? Well, he was working for uh, the uh, U.S. Army Map Service. Oh, the, okay. Uh, this actually predated uh, NASA by a bit. Uh, but he did have dreams of one day being an astronaut. Uh, he was a brilliant astronomer, Ph.D., as you said, from, uh, from Harvard. And it was a time when there were not many astronomers around. Uh, he was fired almost to the day that the Soviets launched Sputnik, mm. sending the United States into a panic about how we're going to lose the space race and the Russians are going to control outer space and we need smart people to catch up. And at the same time, they're busy firing Frank Kameny. Yeah. I should uh, button up the Carl Rizzi story. He, he, his, his supervisor actually stood up for him and he was able to keep his job? He did. How did that? <laughs> That's well, the, uh, his supervisor had enough uh, juice to uh, make the, the postal inspectors back off. Uh, the story is that um, Rizzi was interviewed for several hours uh, by the postal inspectors, offered to uh, send a better picture if they, if they would like. But as he tells it, he went back to his office and he burst into tears at his desk and he started cleaning out his desk because he figured, I'm fired. And he says his boss came out and said, you know, Carl, what's up? And Carl Rizzi explained, and the boss went into his office and called the postal inspectors and said, uh, as, as Carl Rizzi told us, he said, I know Rizzi's gay. You know, you didn't need an investigation to, to discover that. And he happens to do a really good job here, so back off. And they did. Josh Howard is the producer and director of Lavender Scare. Where can people see it, Josh? Uh, the film will be uh, released on DVD uh, uh, later this year and um, will also be on available streaming. And you can check out our website, thelavenderscare.com, and that will have all the information about where to find it. What do you think is the relevancy, or is there a relevancy of this story to our political and social well, world today? There really is. And uh, you know, when I started working on this you know, 10 years ago, uh, I, I really saw it as an interesting slice of history. And now, as it turns out, there are, you know, the message of the film has, does have real relevance. Uh, 
you know, the homophobia of the 1950s was a direct reaction to a period that came before in which um, you know, people didn't pay as much attention to homosexuality and it was a little bit, you know, more accepted. And, uh, you know, we could be going through another period now in which, you know, there is a little pushback. We now have a, uh, a ban on transgender Americans serving in the military. Uh, there are a number of states have religious liberty um, mm. uh, legislation that clearly is aimed at limiting LGBTQ rights. Uh, we see the number of federal court judges on the district level and the Supreme Court who have uh, histories of ruling against the interests of, uh, of gay people. And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's, could, there is, I think it was Mark Twain who said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. <laughs> and I do think we're in a period now that rhymes with the 1950s in many, in many ways. That's a good, ending with Mark Twain is, is always a good idea. <laughs> always try to do that. I'm glad you did. Um, the film is something you must see, and therefore you've got to go to that website, thelavenderskeer.com, to find it. Uh, Josh, it's uh, been a delight to talk to you about this and to be educated about this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.